Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I am Bethany Hines, the Director of Strategy and Network Operations here at Best Friends. And I'm so excited to share this evening with you guys and our wonderful panelists, uh, Michelle Logan and Tyranny Sane. Uh, they will be joining us for this evening's session, Innovative Ways to Work with At-Risk Dogs. So I'm sure you're all here and we're here because in our work, we often uh, run into dogs that need a little bit more support or different support from a behavioral perspective, whether it's just a simply shy dog or perhaps a dog that's never been introduced to a leash before, all the way to some of the most challenging behavioral cases that we encounter. Tonight's session is chock full of tips and tricks on how to use uh, traditional tools in non-traditional ways how to do it yourself and make new and, and inexpensive tools um, to work with these dogs safely, um, to keep them happy, and of course, us safe. Um, lots of great things. One thing I will start by saying, um, tonight's session has a lot of videos in it and a lot of photos. Um, these videos are real life <laughs> shot at the sanctuary. So there will be dogs in the background and the volume changes from time to time. So you will wanna stick close to your volume button in case you need to adjust it slightly uh, as you hear dogs bark barking in the background. Um, the tips and tricks range from everything from how to muzzle dogs, how to leash dogs, how to work with dogs medically in a safe way, um, how to use crates in innovative ways, um, so we're super excited for this evening's session. Again, we will have uh, Michelle and Tierney joining us live to answer your questions um, after we view the presentation. Before we jump in, I've got a couple quick housekeeping items to run through. I promise I'll be fast. Uh, first, you guys are all as attendees automatically muted and you can't turn your cameras on. So you don't have to worry about accidentally unmuting yourself during the presentation. We'll take care of that on our end, sit back, relax, enjoy the session. Um, that being said, we definitely wanna hear from you throughout the session. And so keep an eye on the chat box. As you see, we will share information and resources with you via the chat. Um, additionally, we absolutely want your questions. Michelle and Tierney are here to answer those questions. And so how you submit those is the Q&A box. If you look on your navigation um, in the bottom middle part of your screen, you'll see Q&A, you can pop that in, type your questions in. There's no need to wait until the live Q&A. You can go ahead and submit those in advance. You can start typing them in right now if you want to. And we will get to as many of those as possible. Um, our last housekeeping item is just a reminder that the session tonight is going to be recorded. Um, so if you miss something or don't get a chance to view a chat resource, we will compile all of that and send it to you guys in an email early next week. Additionally, the recording and resources from tonight will be posted on network.bestfriends.org under our town hall. All right, with that, the housekeeping has concluded and I'm super excited to dive into this session with you. If we could have our producer tee it up. I do want to start off with a little bit of a disclaimer here. You'll notice we're in the same room and not socially distanced. Um, Tierney and I do both work together on a daily basis and are both vaccinated. So I just wanted to put that out there from the start. Um, and I want to ask everybody to take a moment and picture that situation. I think you all know the one I'm talking about, that dog that sticks with you and you think, I could have, I should have, I would have. Hindsight can be a really powerful gift and the best growth opportunity if we let it. However, all too often our nature, and I myself am guilty of this, is to beat ourselves up for not thinking of something in that moment, not reading what the dog was telling us, or simply not knowing an option of what else we could do. For me, that dog is Twinkie. She was a beautiful pit bull in the first shelter I ever worked in, who was overstimulated in the shelter environment. And I'll be honest with you, I can now say overstimulated, but back then, I didn't even know what that term was. All I knew was that Twinkie was nuts. And if you went into the kennel with her, she attacked your boots. Had I known then what I know now, the outcome of that situation for Twinkie could have been very different. But at the time, I didn't know the first thing about how to help a dog be comfortable in a muzzle or how to help them see a catch pole as a positive thing. 
What we're about to share with you can have practical applications in almost any setting. Some of these are traditional tools we're all familiar with in our analysis. And some of them may be a bit unique when it comes to us utilizing them. But throughout this presentation, we're gonna show you non-traditional use of traditional tools and the use of everyday items in novel ways. This presentation is packed with videos of things you can emulate in your own environment. Whether you have to quickly get a task done safely or you wanna work with a dog to slowly counter condition them to accepting something. Throughout this presentation, we challenge you to think of your own Twinkie and the ideas or techniques that we're about to share that you could have used had you known about them and to keep those ideas in your toolbox for future similar situations. Before we get started, we just wanna introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is Michelle Logan. I am the Director of National Shelter Embed Programming for Best Friends Animal Society, and currently also serving as the Interim Director of Dogtown. I've been with Best Friends Animal Society for about 15 years. Um, I have a bachelor's in animal science and a history of working in shelters. And I am Tierney Sane. I am a supervisor here in Dogtown at Best Friends Sanctuary in Canab. Um, prior to my arrival here about eight years ago, I was volunteering at local shelters and rescues and I actually started with Best Friends as a care staff. Um, so I worked directly with a lot of the challenging dogs that uh, really needed a little bit of extra help to get them along into hopefully forever homes. And Tierney, I bring a ton of personal experience working with some pretty challenging dogs and also have the honor of leading a team who are some of the most creative and innovative individuals that you'll see that literally don't take no for an answer. Um, and we're really proud to be able to show, you'll see a lot of them in these videos that we're about to share. Um, and I do wanna also mention that we know, you know, here at Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, we know we have more time and resources than a lot of other organizations do. And while we may not have the constraints that some do, we do embody a sense of urgency in both helping the dogs in our care, as well as helping them progress so that they can be adopted out and open up space for other dogs. So we do embody that sense of urgency here. The team is using a bubble wand with peanut butter on it to reward him and keep him busy while practicing modified leash work through the fence. You'll notice they're also using tools to refrain from touching him as well as a loop collar for added safety. He's so focused on the peanut butter that the new action of leashing and unleashing him doesn't phase him. Okay, so this is a simple loop lead used a lot of the time. Um, and this is the tightener here that goes around the neck. We're taking a regular leash and clipping it to that part of the loop lead. That is going to help us loosen this neck loop when we need to get the dog off, hands off. This is riff raff. We're gonna do a little loop lead over the half door, have that half door protecting us. And we have that regular leash still attached that we're going to keep it nice and loose that pink regular leash perfect and let's let Riff Raff walk out wonderful go back with Angie I gave him a big one and we're going to pull that regular leash the pink one and as we pull, that should essentially loosen the loop lead and you're able to take it off his neck, hands off. So you'll notice that in some of those videos, we were doing a lot of leashing techniques. 
And with the first dog, his name is Aslan, um, we're actually using a very different type of tool. We're using a bubble wand. Um, that's his reward stick. And we found the only way we could really work with him to get him engaged and keep his attention was to use cream cheese. Um, so we actually dipped that bubble wand in cream cheese and that's what we used to keep him comfortable uh, during the training while he was getting used to the leashing with a modified leash, which we'll talk about a little bit later. There's also an easy tip trick um, with loop leads that we use all the time. Um, and you can just simply clip a normal leash to that loop lead and it can allow you to be completely and entirely hands off while working with a dog you do need to get out on a leash some way, somehow. Um, and in our last video, we also were working with Bubba J, who um, was catch pole trained and it took a little bit of time to get there, but we made it a very positive tool. Um, so he loved it. It was his leash. That's what he went for activities on. And it just took a little bit of reward training um, to get him used to that cable around the neck. But we were able to <laughs> leash hands off and unleash hands. So you'll notice in those photos that those are modified leashes and they're aluminum or PVC piping with regular leashes fed through them. So you can improvise with the tools you have available. These simply allow the handler to keep the dog at a safe distance away from them, but not necessarily have the same cable loop that a traditional catch pole would have. And that allows some dogs to be more comfortable. Um, the cable on a catch pole can be scary sometimes. So these modified leashes clip regular, just like a regular leash. Um, they're pretty easy to make, and you can make it so there's no slack, no leeway in that leash or that cable that's fed through it. So you are in control of the situation and are able to hold the dog away from you. So this here is Bernie, and we're still getting to know Bernie, and he has some stiff body language with us. Um, also some issues with leashing and leaning over. So we do a double leash with him um, through the fence uh, so he doesn't have the opportunity to do anything naughty. And the double leash allows us, if he were to go after one of us, um, antagonistically on a walk, it allows the other handler to hold him away from us. So we're going to go ahead and leash him now. So Bernie is a dog that uh, is fairly new here and he's given us some stiff body language. Um, so we kind of had to be creative in how we were working with him. Of course, we wanted him to get out. We wanted to do fun things with him, uh, but we weren't sure how much we could do and how soon we could do it. So a really cool safe technique you can use is simply using two leashes. It automatically encompasses a buddy system. So you have a handler there, another handler there to help you. Um, if anything were to go awry, but you can clip um, like a normal leash and then he's kind of in the middle of the two handlers. So if he were to lunge or go after one or the other, the other handler is able to keep him away. And you'll see he's kind of used to this. We were very lucky in that he wasn't afraid of it, wasn't weirded out by what we were doing, but he's just easy, happy, going on his walk, no problems there. And with the modified leash, um, you saw Troy getting unhooked on it. So uh, he is a dog, like many dogs, who really don't like returning to their kennel. Um, and sometimes they're willing to bite, lash out, and in Troy's case, that's what he would do. Uh, so we kind of tried a few different things to make going back to the kennel fun. We'd spend time with him in the kennel when we got back. We even tried food trails all the way back into the kennel, but it was not working. He still, in those moments, was so over threshold um, that we weren't able to get him back and keep him calm. So the modified leash allowed us to stay at a safe distance. And you'll notice that the immediate second he gets back into that run, he's licking that peanut butter off of that bubble wand um, and it allows us to safely get that leash unhooked from his collar. We're gonna move on to some videos involving muzzling. You know, I think we all are aware, right? Muzzles are a way to keep you and the dog safe. 
Um, however, not all dogs are comfortable and will easily put a muzzle on. In emergencies, you may have to do a quick, you know, leash muzzle or simply force the muzzle on the dog. Um, if you have just a little more time, you can figure out what motivates the dog and really expedite that process. Sometimes we have to try new methods and they're not always going to be successful. You'll see the team attempting to muzzle a dog with intense object fixations for the first time. It didn't go as planned, but it's still interesting to watch a failed attempt and brainstorm on how to do it better the next time. So this was a trial and error video. Um, you'll notice it was not super pretty and that's what happens. Uh, so Charm is the dog um, in the video here and she actually really struggles with object fixations. And I can say that, uh, but it's, it's pretty intense. Um, and if she were to accidentally get the clothes of a handler or accidentally get the arm of a handler, she's willing to take, she's willing to bite. 
Um, and it's not intentional necessarily. She just needs something in her mouth. And we discovered that muzzle training her would just expand her world completely. She'd be able to go more places, do more things, all while keeping the handler safe. Um, so you'll notice uh, Kate and Davlin here are working with a Baskerville muzzle. And we, our intention um, was to feed a, a toy through the muzzle that was an appropriate size so that she's safely muzzled and we can interact with her. But she also has a toy in her mouth, which we discovered she actually really needs. What a beach, Charmy. Oh, do you want me to do the bowling pin? Or are you just going to give it now? Um, I think I'll do it just to have this. Oh, just I'm do it all by yourself. By <laughs> shake it, shake it, shake it. Beauty Charmy, you got a new pin. Oh, Debra. <laughs> She sees it. Oh man, look at it. Yeah, yo. First try. Probably shouldn't say that while I'm still healthy. Yeah. Yeah, look at you, girl. And this is the final product with Charm. So we actually thought, how can we make it so Charm can go out with one handler and keep it safe? We just don't have time to always utilize two people to get her out when she needs to get out. Um, so introducing the muzzle box. Um, this was just a simple plastic uh, hollow tube that we um, installed against a tree and we're able to feed a toy through that muzzle of an appropriate size that she enjoys. It's super high value. And we feed that muzzle into the box. She approaches the box and grabs that toy, allowing us to strap the muzzle. And then we'll head out for an activity. And she's able to safely interact with humans. Um, while she's on muzzle, she comes and visits all of her friends. And she also loves to play tug. So we're using toys here that have a rope so we can play tug while we're walking her, which actually I think she enjoys more than anything else. So it's like doing two wonderful things for this dog um, to help her get her energy out and keep everybody safe. And she essentially puts the muzzle on herself. <laughs> Fencing here, you can see Gryffindor or Griff as we call him for short. And he's a dog who is not comfortable being touched or handled yet. He doesn't go out to walk on leash. And we're looking for innovative ways to help expand his world and also safe ways to do medical handling for him. So you can see he's behind his guillotine here. And in front, I have a wire crate with his meal. We also have his muzzle clipped to the back and secured and there's peanut butter spread in the muzzle. So for his meal time, the idea is he goes into the open crate and eats his food and also feels free to explore the muzzle and lick the peanut butter out of it to get him more accustomed to the muzzle. Once he's more comfortable going into the crate, we'll be able to close the crate safely by pulling a leash in order to close the door. That way we won't have to be in the same space as him while he's eating because he is also a food guard. Here he's choosing to lick the peanut butter off the outside of the muzzle, but that's okay too because it's still building his confidence with the muzzle, getting him used to seeing it, and building a positive association. And sometimes we even combine techniques. Check out these next videos of Tesla crate and muzzle training. So this is Tesla. And Tesla is prone to high arousal spikes, and in those moments, she is willing to bite her handler. So when she is interacting with us, she is always on muzzle. 
Um, and to do that, we put her in a crate first through the fence to keep her safe, us safe. Upon exiting Tesla's crate, she gets her basket muzzle put on. We put um, some treats in there so she readily sticks her snout in. And once she exits, um, we would harness her and go for our walk. And sometimes when you have no other option and simply cannot muzzle a dog and need to quickly vaccinate them, the following video can show you a technique to do that. All right, so this is Pup Pup, and we're going to show how we can help give Pup Pup a vaccine. Where we can safely go ahead then and poke him in the back. So Kayla's holding his leash through the door here, and we're just gently squeezing him through. And that would allow you to take a dog that doesn't like being muzzled, nor like being handled, and get him the appropriate vaccine. So many of us use various feeding techniques to help enrich the dogs. Um, and there's a whole variety of feeding tubes out there and do-it-yourself options. Sometimes we need to figure out how to feed the dog safely, meaning we can't safely enter their run to give them something. Um, and we may or may not have the option to utilize a guillotine to do so. So we opt for alternatives and innovative solutions to help. <coughs> Okay, you want to do the trick? <laughs> We did find uh, the tray, obviously, isn't the best for her. We did find adding these binder clips to the trays. If you saw how she was pulling the tray in there, if I were feeding her like that and I was by myself and we didn't have this alternative, a lot of dogs would then just keep the tray. So this allows us to leash up to it so they don't get to steal the tray. So Logan and I actually had to feed this dog. Um, and I am in with this dog, but Logan is not. And she has a tendency to practice naughty behaviors while people that aren't her friends are feeding her. And we just, she's a long-term resident. We didn't want her practicing this behavior. We actually developed this feeding tube for her um, that she uses. But you'll notice the difference uh, when we tried with the tray as opposed to using the feeding tube. And it's simply just PVC pipe for her. And then we're not at her level um, in her face while she's eating. And um, it was really fun for me to watch. <laughs> And it's funny that we call it a feeding tube because most people will medically think of that as a tube that gets inserted. So please be sure to reference that video and photo. <laughs> so this next video, you know, sometimes here at Dogtown, we try some innovative things and it winds up being a little more entertaining for those of us that are actually doing the video than for the dog. <laughs>
And this is just a super fun video. We were trying to pro provide enrichment um, for a dog we weren't able to go into the run with at the time. And um, balloons are super fun to pop. So it was just funny to, to watch her try and get that balloon over the fence. <laughs> So we're going to move on to some crate techniques. You know, having dogs enter wire crates and doing so comfortably can lead to a willingness to enter other crates, um, you know, which are then utilized for safe transportation, um, but also some other innovative solutions for dogs that may be a little more challenging. Go. Go for And crates are essential for doing medical safely. Some of you may be familiar with the squeeze box technique um, using a wire crate and two by fours, um, which we do sometimes use in addition to uh, this do-it-yourself version that we created. And then once you have a dog that's comfortable to go into the wire crate, you can do things like this. Is it flowing good or just dripping? It's flowing good. They're like, oh, now he's eating. <laughs> See the <Stop>. fluid. <laughs> when attempting to do necessary things with dogs that will willingly accept it can require some creativity. Uh, these are some innovative ways we found worked to groom and actually trim Aslan's nails completely hands off. Like it looks like it's scabby. <laughs> Good boy. I think we've 
all experienced times, right, where a dog has some medical procedure and you need them to wear a cone, um, but they may or may not allow you to actually put that cone on um, and they may or may not accept you taking it off. Um, here are some tricks we use here that you can try. this session gave you some new ideas and tips and tricks that you can utilize to help the most at-risk dogs of the country in the country that you have the opportunity to work with and that we've empowered you to potentially have a different outcome for your very own Twinkie. Wow, that session was great. It was full of so much information, tips and tricks. Uh, I love the focus on kind of the do it yourself. Um, don't feel like you're boxed into the traditional tools or using them in traditional ways. Um, there's so many different things you can do to be creative um, to work with these guys. So now I would like to bring on uh, live Michelle Logan, our director of national inbed programming and Tierney Sane, our national, our national shelter support program specialist. Sorry. Thank you so much guys for being here tonight. Um, you both have very extensive backgrounds at the sanctuary in Dogtown and working with shelters. So it's sort of this perfect combination of how can we take learnings from the sanctuary and translate them for our audience tonight who are working in foster-based rescues and, and shelters. So thank you so much. Um, we're gonna enter the live Q&A portion. Uh, for our attendees, we see some questions rolling in. Uh, please use your Q&A box to ask those throughout this evening. Um, I've got a couple pre-submitted ones that I wanna get to first. Um, so to get rolling with those, our first one this evening, um, what are some general training tips for dogs that display stranger anxiety or aggression? Sure, I can start off on that and Tierney just jump in as you want to. Um, you know, I think often for dogs, we have this expectation, right, that they're just going to accept our friends and that our friends are their friends, right? So we want to really slowly counter condition the dog to being comfortable around strangers. And you can start doing that by, you know, pairing positive things that the dog likes with strangers. It also depends on the dog's reaction to those strangers, i.e. are they cowering in the corner and scared or are they, you know, advancing forward and trying to, you know, bite the stranger. So it, it's really varying there. But I think the, the biggest, most important thing we can do is take it slow with that dog, right? Let's not force him to accept everybody as his or her friend. And dogs really benefit from consistency. So finding a routine that works for that individual dog on how they want to meet new people. And then if it works, stick with that every time. And then they know what to expect. And if you want to add another tool to their toolbox, Muzzle training um, is also great for dogs that have stranger danger. Yeah, I love the focus on consistency. Like I have a toddler, for example, and just being consistent with her and creating that predictability is so helpful. Um, thank you for that. Uh, another question that was pre-submitted. Uh, we've got an organization that's been working with a dog with some behavioral issues. They made some progress, but the dog is still in care with them and then has kind of plateaued. Um, and they're stuck. And so what are kind of next steps to, to get the dog progressing again? 
again, I think consistency does play into that, making sure the shelter staff and the volunteers are all on the same page, doing the same thing with the dog and that it's getting plenty of enrichment. Um, a lot of times when we think about enrichment, we think of physical um, activities, so walks and things like that. Mental is just as important, mental stimulation for dogs as well. So providing that dog with plenty of mental uh, stimulation in the kennel, outside the kennel, whatever it may be, um, to just try and give them those outlets so they're still getting positive interaction and hopefully making progress and continuing to move forward and then not regressing or losing things they've already learned. And if the dog is in a shelter environment, try giving them a break from the shelter environment, right? If you can safely, you know, have a staff member that can take them home for an evening or a volunteer or something like that to just give them something different um, that generally can help them just kind of decompress a little bit. I know we have a sleepover program at the sanctuary and uh, some of our really high activity dogs that you think are just like off the wall all day long, running around, barking, having fun. Like they'll go on a sleepover and literally like sleep the entire time from like 6 p.m. to like 8 a.m. when they come back the next day. So sometimes they just need that break from that constant, you know, noise and, and activity going on. Yeah, it's such a good point. No matter what we do in our shelters, it, it's always going to be a stimulating environment. And in, in yeah. sometimes you just have to take a breather from that for sure. Uh, I'll do one more pre-submitted one before I jump into the live ones that are rolling in. Do you guys have any pointers for working with a high energy bully type who is a leash grabber? A good management tool, and it's not the answer, but a good management tool if it hasn't been tried yet is to consider a chain leash or a cable leash. They're just not going to like that on their teeth. Um, but it also gives you that management so you can work on training in the interim, try and get them to a point where they don't even think of doing that when they have a normal leash on again. Um, and rewarding positive behaviors, awesome, uh, with food or whatever the dog finds valuable on walks. Um, so every good behavior, four on the floor, if you're getting eye contact, reward for those things. Any alternative behaviors um, that you see, we want to reward so they kind of learn, oh, this is what you want me to do, and that's what you don't want me to do. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to sneak over to a live question because when I heard you say chain leash, I remember seeing that in the live questions. I am using a second monitor. So you guys are going to see me going like this. I promise I'm still here and paying attention. Um, but we had a question come in early on. Um, this individual, uh, they get a lot of leash biting and traditional um, with traditional leashes that we show we showed in some of our videos. And they're saying, what techniques do you have to avoid that other than using chain leashes? So A, are chain leashes bad? And B, do we have alternatives to those? I don't think chain leashes are, are bad, but they we're not necessarily fixing the problem. We're kind of in a way putting a Band-Aid on it, mm -hmm. um, if that's our only answer. So again, going back to the rewarding, um, the positive behaviors can be helpful, but also um, just allowing the dog to stay calm. If it's a high energy dog, we don't necessarily want to amp the dog up more. So sometimes if we have a jumpy mouthy dog, high energy in the shelter, what have you, we want to take the dog running, right? When actually what's best for that dog is to stay calm and to practice calm behaviors. So they, they kind of start to understand that that's um, a positive tool they need to, you know, give us um, to be successful. I think it's important too, right? The dog is getting some satisfaction out of biting on the leash, right? We don't necessarily have to understand what satisfaction that is for the dog, but is there an alternative we can provide him? In that one video with Charm where she has that object fixation, right? If she didn't have, I mean, she was muzzled on top of that, but the toy in her mouth when she wasn't muzzled, that's to keep her from grabbing everything else, right? So finding something that the dog maybe wants to carry around. You know, if the, the biting on the leash is an issue, muzzle train the dog and see if maybe he'll walk on muzzle and not bite the leash. Another thing too is, is sometimes dogs are just so excited, right? That they're just doing everything. Sometimes you can set a dog up where like, before I come in and leash you up, you're gonna sit. And when you start to stand up as I come in, I back out. So I'm um, conditioning you to do the behaviors that I like as opposed to those that I don't like. Oftentimes when a, a dog is jumping and grabbing a leash like that, our instinct is let's get them down this row of kennels and outside as quick as possible. And we're actually rewarding that bad behavior and what we don't like, which helps them to do it more and more each time. So instead, let's not reward that behavior and teach them an alternative that is acceptable. Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Um, uh, this is a question from the audience. Uh, can you share specific duration exercises for muzzle training? So they are able to get the dog muzzled, but then there's no tolerance for keeping the muzzle on once the dog's been muzzled. Yeah, I think some of it's for the, right? The dog is telling you like, that's too much right now. What I've seen sometimes be beneficial is actually to use a gentle leader or a head halty to start off with on the dog, right? Because you're essentially getting the same sensation of them wearing a muzzle, but their actual muzzle, right, is still free. So sometimes that can help a dog build up duration. Obviously, right, food motivated dogs, treats and things like that. Um, you know, I know a lot of dogs, you put it on initially and they're pawing, we're going too fast, right? So there's other things you can do is pairing the muzzle with things the dog already enjoys. In some of the videos you saw, like with um, Gryffindor, the staff was trying to counter condition him to even being in the presence of the muzzle. So we may have gone too fast with this dog by even just clipping the muzzle on his face and may need to back it off and start doing association. Even to the point, if it's you know a dog that you're taking out on leash, a lot of times I'll just clip the muzzle like to my belt loop. So the dog gets used to being around me and proximity to the muzzle. Yeah, and just a quick clarifier. So these techniques can work for dogs that are still in the shelter, but it can also work for dogs in foster care or even dogs after adoption. Like these are these are tools we can give our adopters to work with the dogs after adoption. It, it doesn't have to be done in the structure of a shelter setting, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Okay, um, let's see here. Uh, what tool is being used to pull the collar close to unhook the leash? It looked like large tweezers. We saw lots of shots with that where they were um, stabilizing the leash or the collar with a tool. Could you explain that more? I honestly think we just used pliers. That's what they yeah. looked like. Yeah. Was it really They're just that? They're long handled pliers. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, most of us have those. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so a question that came in is one of our discussion points. So do you see dogs that are displaying signs of depression after that overnight enrichment experience? So when they return the next morning? Yeah, and I'm not a scientist, but we actually did a study on that of the cortisol levels in the dogs um, using the dogs at the sanctuary to, to gauge that. And we did not see, um, whichever way cortisol goes when it's bad, <laughs> right? I said, I'm not a scientist on that, um, but there were, um, you know, behaviorists that did that study, swabbing the dogs and testing the cortisol levels, and they did not see a difference in that. And honestly, you can watch the individual dog and see, right? So if you send a dog on a sleepover and the, the volunteer can't get the dog out of the car and the dog doesn't want to come back in, right? Then, you know, maybe that's not a, a repeat candidate that you want to be putting that dog through where other dogs are like, sweet, okay, I go over there, hop right out of the car and go right back in their kennel. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> um, any suggestions for when a shelter refuses to transfer more difficult behavior dogs or dogs that are declining due to stress to rescue groups that could work with them this way? So how can rescue groups um, demonstrate that they have the capacity to work with these dogs with shelter partners that are more hesitant to do that transfer? I think honestly, sitting down and have an honest conversation to truly understand what is the shelter's hesitation to this, and then using facts and data to show that you actually do have a system set up to be able to handle animals like that. Yeah, it's such a great point. And it points back, we did a uh, editorial recently, and we can throw this if a producer can put this in the chat, just talking about like contract language. So if, if a shelter has the shelter rescue have solid contract ling language in that transfer, there's not a liability aspect on the shelter that, you know, they're taking the dog and they're putting it in the care of the rescue. So as a rescue, you're assuming that liability. And so that's kind of another talking point you can use with your shelters that you're pulling from. Sure. Um, for the dogs that use the bubble wand, did you try different things to see what would entice them? Um, we try to offer different value treats, but in, in a shelter environment, it's stressful. Um, so sometimes they won't necessarily take what you want to give them as a value treat. Yeah, we have to use something different for every single dog, pretty much all dogs are individuals, obviously. So like with Aslan, who we did a lot of leashing work with in the videos, um, we had to use cream cheese. He didn't even really want peanut butter or anything like that. So we just had to find uh, what worked 
for that particular dog. Um, you can also use wet food. Wet food is super high value. If you feed, you know, a certain type of dry food at the shelter, um, if you have wet food available in that kind as well, they're not necessarily going to get diarrhea either. They're already eating it. Um, so you can try that. If it's a shy, fearful dog you're working with that isn't you know, comfortable enough to take food in front of you or just so stressed in the environment. They don't want to do it in front of you. I do flybys a lot. So I'm just putting things into that kennel and then I'm leaving. I walk away, come back a few minutes later, see if things have been picked up or, or moved in any way, but see what else they find valuable and try and build a relationship with that dog um, to get them to a point where they do feel comfortable engaging and interacting with you more, which could just be as simple as spending time with the dog. Yeah, that's such a good point. It may not be that the treat that you're using on the bubble wand is the issue. It's that you're there holding it. That's the issue. So trying to do that flyby approach where it's let's figure out what they like when I'm not around and then bring that back when I am around. I never would have thought of that. Such a great point. Um, a question from the audience. I will use a slip chain not as a collar, um, but to be, pardon me, I will use a slip chain not as a collar, but to be used as a short chain segment near the collar by clipping the regular leash to one loop of the slip and then attaching a carabiner to the other end of the slip loop. So the collar, um, there's a short section near the chain of the collar. That's an amazing tip right there. Thank you for sharing that because essentially what you're doing, right, is you're giving the dog the, the piece of leash that is closest to their mouth that they're probably going to bite on. You're using that chain collar to create that but the dog still has their own soft collar on and you still have the regular leash on the other end. That's brilliant. Yeah, super innovative. All right, um, let's see here. Gosh, I'm trying to read through these quickly. Um, we have a home for the holidays program and I worry that after being in a happy home for a time they get returned, it's too depressing. We did sort of address that already with the, the cortisol levels and just, you know, if you have a dog that doesn't respond well to an overnight or weekend foster programs, maybe not using them again, but definitely try them. Um, and Bethany, I know our producers um, are looking for that study. It is somewhere on our website. I just don't know the URL off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. We will get it and we will chat it in resources. And again, for our folks um, attending this evening, you'll get those emailed to you Monday as well. Um, so if you're not monitoring the chat and clicking on those, you'll get them in your inbox too. Thank you, um, Michelle. Okay, let me trying to go through here. So we read that one. Um, do you have any tips or tricks for doing back nails and dew claws? I know we looked at that a little bit with, I think, Aslo and, and the, um, sc not scraper board, but the like, was, was that like a sandpaper board or like a, a Dremel board? I'm not sure what to call it. <laughs> it was like some type of sandpaper or something that coated that, yeah. Um, I think you can do that same concept for back legs. Logan, do you have any suggestions on do class? <laughs> yeah. So, and again, right, it comes down to the individual dog and their comfort level. Like what is the dog not comfortable with? Some dogs aren't comfortable at all with you, you know, holding their paw or the sensation and the noise of the clipping. And this may not necessarily help with that specific do claw, right? It depends on, right. Are you talking about trying to get that paw like hands off, do a clip on that? Um, but what, one tip that I have found that works really well for dogs is you're starting to desensitize them to having their toenails clipped is to use, use old school matchsticks and put them by the dog's paw and then clip the matchstick and not the paw. So this routine repeated behavior, they start to get the sensation of a little bit of that feel and the noise that it makes, but nothing ever happens to them. And then over time, you can start to do three matchsticks and one toenail and kind of sneak it in there. That's a really good tip. And you could probably use things like thin chopsticks and stuff too, like anything if you don't have uh, matches around. That's a really good yeah. pointer. Um, if we, we have an a anonymous, question, anonymous question from an attendee, if you lure a dog into the muzzle and they panic once it's collapsed, could this affect further muzzle training negatively? I would say if you're luring a dog into a muzzle, i.e. they're not willingly put their face in it, then you shouldn't clip it in the right off the, out the gate like that anyway. So you should, again, build up that duration, their comfort level being around the muzzle. Obviously, if you need to do something and you need to, you know, you need the muzzle and need to clip it immediately, do so for your own safety. But the dog will help tell you at what speed you can progress. So don't push it. And honestly, if you put it on them and you think they're fine and you clip it and they start to panic, 
give them praise, give them a reward, get it off their face quickly, right? But then restart. Don't take the muzzle away at that moment and never show it to them again, because then they're going to associate that with the scary thing that happened and on a high note. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we saw in the charm videos that when there was the first interaction that was failed, it didn't work like you guys retreated and then came back and did it again and it worked for her and she had the toy stimulus in there and she was fine. Or like the second one when she went to, went into it straight in the tree, like she willing, willingly went in, it was a great time to clip it, it worked good. Whereas I want to say, um, was it Gryffindor where you guys used the peanut butter just to start to get him comfortable putting his face in and you weren't trying to clip it at that point. You're getting him to, to learn to go into it himself as opposed to forcing the interaction. And I don't know if everyone heard that in the video or not, right? But just the, the care staff that was working with Gryffindor on that, like he didn't do what she had set it up to. She set it up so that he would go in the crate and stick his face in. He was licking the peanut butter off the backside, but he was still close to the muzzle and associating, right? So each dog is going to tell you. I know for me, I worked with a dog one time, like zip tying it to the fence and he just ripped it right off the fence. And it's like, no, thanks. I don't want this here. So you come up with something else. Yeah. It's such a good point. We are at the top of the hour. There's a couple of questions we didn't get to. Um, Michelle and Tierney, thank you guys so much for being here tonight. This was a bunch of great information. Um, you have that additional supplemental video uh, that we've included in the chat for the audience. You guys, again, we'll get that on email. I think kind of some of the, the biggest takeaways is be creative, go slow, take the time that it takes. Um, any other closing thoughts from either of you guys before we wrap up for the evening? I just want to thank everybody for attending and, and for giving the time, right, that you're all giving to these dogs and your willingness to be here and to try something different and to share your great ideas, like the, the chain, right, the chain collar used as part of the leash, like keep sharing. It's what it's all about. We all have different levels of ability to try things and have success and have failures. Celebrate those successes and celebrate the failures too, because it teaches you something to try differently next time. Absolutely. Thank you guys for attending. I think you said it perfectly, Logan. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. See you later. Bye.